Nomine Patris, et Fidi, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Deo, pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et oror mortis nostre. Amen. Nomine Patris, et Fidi, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Brethren in Christ, laude to Jesus Christus. In secula. This is Timothy S. Flanders with the Meeting of Catholic. I'm here today with co-host Kennedy Hall. Kennedy, how you doing, brother? I'm good. We had major storms last night, so the kids were all coming into our bedroom all, all night. All right, so you got uh, four hours of sleep, right? A little, a little bit more, maybe. There's always, there's always a. I mean, it's five, six hours. You got like when you went, when you put your head down on the on the pillow, when you got it up, but then there's all these things in between. In between. So yeah. Just kind of get used to uh, part of the sleep habit. So today we're talking about a man's work, the meaning of work. We're also going to talk about. Uh, Vigano's latest, which is an interesting twist on Lefebvre and the controversy surrounding the Society of St. Pius X. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome to the 14th week after Pentecost. We have a number of wonderful feasts today, and we'll talk about what today is. Today is, the, is a civil holiday in the United States, Labor Day. And Canada. Uh, Canada has it too? Yeah, we have ours has a U in it though because it's more sophisticated. Oh yes, of course. Yes, Labor <laughs> Day. Yeah. Uh, so do y'all? Do y'all all uh, get off the day? Most people don't work today. Is that correct? Yeah. It's yeah. It's, uh, okay. It's like a bank holiday, or whatever. Right. <laughs> bank holiday. Yeah, yeah. So, so today is Labor Day. We'll talk about that a little bit. But this week we have a number of great feasts. First is the birth of the Theotokos, which is tomorrow, September eighth, mm. which is the an excellent feast the the byzantine new year actually starts on september 1st and the it, it, it mimics the it has the life cycle of the the mother of god so it ends with the dormition or assumption of the blessed virgin mary august 15th mm -hmm. and then the new year begins september 1st and then there's the birth of the theotokos september 8th and so the entire year is sort of the life cycle of the christian is the life cycle of the mother of god uh, our our lady is born. Christ comes to earth December 25. Then the, the passion, the cross, resurrection, and the whole cycle of the Christian life until the assumption, which is one's own resurrection. So it's a beautiful feast day. Um, wonderful start to the the new. Uh, it's still even in the Western calendar. It's still uh, beginning of the fall, sort of yeah. the, the beginning of the uh, a new season. And so it's a, a wonderful feast day. Uh, any thoughts on that one, Kennedy? On the Eastern versus Western? Why didn't just, when I remember, you, maybe you've said this on a show before, but when you came from Orthodox, why didn't you go Byzantine, just curiously? Just elevator pitch. Uh, oh, I, I just, uh, I was actually a part of the, what's called Western Rite Orthodoxy, which oh, is, I didn't know that existed. Yeah, there's, I think there's, a, last I checked, there was 24 parishes in the whole world. So it's it's even less, far less than Eastern Catholicism, but it's basically mm -hmm. the parallel to Eastern Catholicism, which is where they have, they actually have the Tridentine Mass, but it's in English, and but they also monkey around with it too, because at least in the Antiochian Western Rite, because they monkey around it because they don't believe in the uh, consecration formula in the same way. So they add into they add the Greek consecration formula into the Tridentine Mass in oh, wow. English. Oh, so it, yeah, it's it's interesting. But I I basically was just raised Western right Lutheran. Always uh, had a Western liturgical culture okay. mindset. So I, I never really went Byzantine. I, I love Byzantine liturgy. I certainly enjoy it. Um, but I'm just a Western, culturally Western Northern European from Flanders. So there you go. There's yeah. So birth of the Theotokos. Speaking of East and West, there's an interesting. Uh, parallel because one of the antiphons for this feast on the other Magnificat or Benedictus, I can't recall, but one of them is actually the Byzantine hymn for the feast is actually the same as the antiphon for the Western feast. So okay. there's a nice little, uh, it's um, that Our Lady has brought forth the Son of Righteousness, Christ our God. And the phrase Christ our God is almost never heard in Western uh, tradition, traditional uh, piety, right. yeah. but it's a, a very common phrase in the East. 
Christ our God. So then we have September 11th and September 12th. Now, September 11th is memorialized in the United States as the, the attack on the Twin Towers. Right. But before that happened, there was September 11th, 1565, the Siege of Malta was lifted. Mm -hmm. And this was a, a siege of the Mohammedans against the Christians. And then in the 17th century, September 11th, 1683, which is the second siege of Vienna, that was the one of the last battles of the Turks, the Mohammedans, in and their incursions. And, and that was September 11th, September 12th. Right. And then September 11th, 1695, was the Battle of Zenta, which is where the Holy League defeated the Turks. And mm -hmm. and that time, the Holy League actually included Russia. They joined in the Holy League, mm -hmm. to their credit. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was when they defeated, that was one of the final battles of, uh, against tipping the tide against the Turks, right. where Hungary and the Balkans were retaken. Now, in the Second Siege of Vienna, it was se September 11th and September 12th of this whole ordeal. And September 12th began, uh, ended up being tied to this Second Siege of Vienna. And so that's the Holy Name of Mary. Hmm. So another Marian feast day. And if you want more details of that, you can take a look at my video, Mary Against the Mohammedans, which is, goes through that whole history. But there's three different September 11th dates, which are military victories. Hmm by the Christians against the Mohammedans, which obviously some have considered that this was the motivation of the- Pick that day, yeah. Uh, yeah, picking that day to strike against the United States. Uh, any thoughts on September 11th, September 12th? Well, actually when I was, uh, when September 11th happened, like the uh, terrorist thing, I was in Italy. That's the year that we lived in Italy. So I remember it was, uh, School doesn't start to in Italy till you know like the end of September, and um, so we were still at home. And then we just kind of flipped on the news. It was CNN International or whatever, and it was crazy. It was a total shock. But we were actually outside of. I mean, things were different. I mean, things didn't really change over there because it was not on home soil. But when I was talking to friends who were in Canada, you know, they all went home for the day because um, you know where I live. I mean, eighty percent of Canadians live about two hours or so from the border. So uh, I'm an hour drive from Port Huron, an hour and a half. And, and so it was kind of close people. So people are actually kind of worried around here as well. I mean, are they going to go to Toronto or whatever? So yeah, that was, was a day the world definitely changed. When people get, so this whole COVID thing, um, I really hope there's not this whole everlasting new normal. It's really annoying. Um, but at the same time, when you look back at September 11th, certain things changed and they never went back. So who knows? Yeah, so I mean, certain people assert that there was some sort of false flag operation. The United States bombed yeah. themselves somehow. There are certain inconsistencies and difficulties with the amounts, sure. different explanations and whatnot. Um, certainly, uh, I don't, I don't, I've not seen enough evidence to really indicate that this was some kind of false flag. But we do know for sure that the United States. So, so um, Donald Rumsfeld who was, I believe, the Secretary of Defense. I forgot what exact position he had, but Donald Brunsfeld had the meeting that morning about whether or not this would be enough to take out Saddam Hussein. So they had a meeting. They had September 11th happen. A few hours later, they were having a meeting about whether they could use that to get into Iraq. Right. So it's, it's really quite astonishing the amount of propaganda that was able to be pulled over the Americans to commit an act of uh, aggression against a sovereign nation yeah. for its own political economic gain. And many, many U.S. Catholics were on the front lines cheering as the United States invaded Iraq. Yeah. So it's a very... <laughs> So, yeah, and like you said, that, I mean, there, you have the Patriot Act and the whole war on terror joke. It was definitely, it was definitely a crisis <laughs> that was not put to waste. But, oh, yeah, definitely. I, the whole war on terror joke is, is the, I mean, that, that's something that's the whole war on terror. War on terror is uh, the most terrorist country is Saudi Arabia, which we pump right. millions of dollars into to fund their own uh, injustice and terrorism to their own people. And we bow down before them to allow them to commit grave injustices against the gospel in preventing Christians from preaching the gospel in Saudi Arabia. 
And all Mohammedans go to Saudi Arabia on their Hajj, and they get inspired to implement the Wahhabism throughout their own locales. And so war on terror is just a joke, a complete <laughs> joke. <laughs> so it's uh, so this is the this is the shadow of September 11th, and I and I think uh, yeah, that really puts it into relief with what you're saying in terms of taking a, a good crisis, never letting a good crisis go to waste. They certainly didn't waste that one. And they're certainly not wasting COVID-1984. There you go. November 3rd. Let's see if things change a bit. Yes, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. The, the stakes are very high. Definitely. So, <clears throat> so today we have Labor Day, which is a civic holiday. Yep. The One of the first things that I thought of was the fact that before the Reformation, so-called Reformation, Protestant Revolt, a peasant had Sunday yep. off every year from work, yep. and then he had an average of more than one day in addition. Yep. So he had the he had the, the holy day, he had, had the Sunday, and then he had the uh, some other holy day. Like for example, this week we have the birth of the Theotokos, September 8th, and we have the Holy Name of Mary. So he may have Sunday off, he may have Tuesday off, and he may have Saturday off yeah. that whole week. So it's an average of more than one day. So he's got 1.2 days or whatever. So at that point, you are your whole cycle of, of your week, every week has a, whole, a, a holy day's cycle in it. And now this was begun to be repressed by Henry VIII and the Protestants who banished the cult of the saints yeah. And part of the motivation was to steal the land from all these peasants, give them to the elites, and then force them to work more to make more money. Yeah. So the it's, Yeah, go ahead. Well, it's um the other day I was listening to uh, you know, off the menu, Charles Coulomb and Vincent Franchini, and uh, they always agree on absolutely everything, but they had a mild disagreement, but I think it was more for the show. But um, Coulomb was saying that in the feudal times, um, and that word feudalism, you know, I mean, I think it comes from the word fidelity or something like that. I mean, you were loyal to your lord. So that word sounds like a bad word, but really it just kind of means loyalty, I think. But in any case, I might be wrong. But um, he was talking about how at that time you had to work about 30 days a year for your lord. And now with the average taxation system, you end up working about... 80 days a year for your tax system. So, and the idea was, so the, the parallel I was trying to make was for your state, whatever you were owed to your state to make sure that you had your infrastructures, you owed 30 days a year. And that would have been farm work and things like that. Not, not just farm, but work for the, the um, estate of your Lord who would own your town or whatever. And then today you owe about 80 days a year of taxes, about 40% of your income, I guess of your workable days. So, and I mean, it's not perfect apples to apples comparison because obviously there are a lot more things now due to technological advances. There's a lot more currency kind of just going around paying for different things. So I guess it's not complete apples to apples, but it is, you know, it is interesting that in our modern day when we've progressed so much, we actually are in more of an indentured servitude, at least mathematically to our state than we were years ago and you know that's why uh, you did your show with uh <clears throat> what was his name again the the professor who talked about um distributism oh um it's uh catholic economics the podcast uh um, right. what's his name <laughs> okay. really, i'm forgetting i'll look up i apologize apologies but yeah well you looked that up so i've always wrestled with um the idea of a distributism and whatever and but yeah, one of the Levi things russell Levi that's right russell, russell. One of the reasons why I've always been sympathetic to at least the, because uh, let's be honest, okay, let's just give the the distributists and the Austrian capitalist types their due. A lot of the time, because distributism is kind of anti-capitalism, you do get, and this is just my opinion, some people that are maybe a little left-leaning will latch onto it as something that's kind of like their socialism. I'm not saying that that's what it is, but I'm saying I can I see how people do that. So I understand why sometimes Catholics get a little bit nervous about the types of folks who might start advocating for it on the internet. And I get that. And the opposite is true. You get the sort of neocon 
George Weigel types going about capitalism as the savior of mankind. Speaking so, about neocons, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. But with distributism, one of the things that's always been um, I've always been sympathetic towards is uh, it really if you if you make material gain the sort of barometer of how good your society is, and you're not in charge of your estate, if you don't have ownership over what of your capital, then you will be worked to the bone. That's just kind of something that human beings have always had to go through. In ancient times, we had slavery of basically everybody. I mean, 90% of people would have been slaves in some capacity. And so these restrictions that have been put on by the church and Catholic economics over the centuries have been sort of the one thing that have stopped us from being wage slaves. And, 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 and I don't know what a better term would be. So today, when we think about how we work, I mean, definitely there's opportunities, definitely there's lots of material success. But if you kind of just get on the, on, the, on the hamster wheel, then you sort of become a wage slave de facto, unless you're really careful about it. Yeah, it, it does work out mathematically that there is a great deal more that it needs to be worked per year to mm -hmm. pay your taxes, to get health benefits and all that sort of thing. The uh, feudal society was also a seasonal work. So yeah. obviously you're doing a lot less work when it's winter time, which is a lot more natural also to the human person because there's the less sun, you, get, you have less energy. It's it's much I mean, it's more, more difficult to work when you know, in our modern setting we work you know the eight to five 40 hours a week all year round yeah and it's just more, a lot more difficult in the winter because it's a lot less natural to do that yeah so yeah i i definitely when i was I, and this happened to the credit of my of my university there was a course i took where we we went into this and we just i discovered how much how much the, the feudal peasant worked less and got more yeah. in terms of true wealth and I yeah. work more and get less. So that's a good term to true wealth. Maybe we should, we should, uh, dive yeah, that's, into that's a shout out to Lowell Forrester. I will have to give credit always to Lowell for this because oh, okay. the, um, yeah, the, the true wealth, the, the way that I've, uh, tried to distill that was free and secure access to the true, the good and the beautiful. Mm -hmm. both naturally and supernaturally and the natural wealth of true good what is true good and beautiful is for the sake of the supernatural wealth yeah. of true good and beautiful so the now the feudal feudal peasant had to deal with viking invasion and disease yeah. in particular those are the two big threats mm -hmm. but the but the uh the modern man has to deal with a spiritual poverty, which is going to send them to eternal damnation. So yeah. I think that, uh, I, mean, I think of it, I <laughs> break it down, like, what is the percentage of the population that received last rites in normal circumstances in the feudal society? And what is the percentage of the population that did not receive, does not receive, nor even requests last rites in our society? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's so, a really There's a really good documentary, uh, Mother Teresa, it was recently her, her memorial right her feast day but but um it's uh i think it's from 1986 she was still alive it's pretty good i've shown it to a bunch of students and it's quite moving and it just follows her for about 10 years or so and um I, it shows when the sisters are they the sisters of charity or the missionaries yeah. of charity yeah sisters of charity. when they set up in new york they were actually astonished how much more detrimental the poverty was than it was in calcutta um, because it wasn't a material poverty, it was a spiritual poverty. And they remarked that and they said, um, you know, it's actually real easy to take care of somebody who needs bread. You just give them bread. It's really hard to take care of somebody who has bread. Because let's be honest, I mean, in North America, you can be completely impoverished and be overweight. It's not like, I mean, obviously there is real hunger. But as far as like how many calories do you need in a day between food banks and, you know, all sorts of things, it's pretty hard to not be able to access that I'm not discounting the real situations but it's not like a third world nation where there just isn't food maybe for a couple days right um and it was uh they realized that the real poverty was loneliness the real poverty was uh isolation away from your families and things which is why this corona thing this the, all the lockdowns from the beginning it just it just struck me as anti-gospel you know it just struck me as anti 
well, just an anti-Christian, anti-Christ, because I remember in the beginning having a conversation with my mother and, and uh, I thought, you know, mom, because she's Italian, so the family values and stuff is pretty important to her. And I said, um, you know, if we are all going to die, we should be together. <laughs> you know, like that's kind of the point. You know, if this, if this is a real invasion of some sort of virus, then we should probably be together because I might never see you again. And she got it. And she went, yeah. And I said, this whole thing where they're trying to keep us apart, this isn't right. You know, we can all, whatever, not to go too much into Corona, but it's, uh, our society is so, maybe, maybe it's an extension of this, this, uh, this, this untrue wealth that we're so accustomed to, I guess, but the isolation with, with Corona, it just seemed to me like an extension of, it was like a logical conclusion of you have your toys, you have your Netflix, you have your, the liquor store is still open. You know, you have your air conditioning and whatever, just stay in your home and you'll be fine until we tell you to come out and we'll keep giving you enough money that you can keep ordering food from you know your favorite takeout place. Anyway, that's just my negative look. Yeah, you, you and I have both been to what is, <laughs> like, we might call pre-industrial or non-industrial countries or so-called yeah. third world countries. Yeah, We've experienced global poverty, urban mm -hmm. poverty, what it really is, because that's that would be real poverty. People living in shanties and garbage. Yeah. That type of thing, and uh, it is remarkable the amount of spiritual riches that these people have, which really shocks you when you come from a place like the United States, Canada, places that are live in opulent luxury, and people are complaining and miserable. And you go to this place where people really have quite pretty much nothing in comparison, and they are joyful, thankful, grateful, their strong mm -hmm. family life. And it's quite remarkable. It's, yeah. it's refreshing and uh, shocking for your Western gospel of, of uh, you know, commercial empire. Yeah, it is. I mean, I know you were in Egypt, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I was in uh, Mexico, like Mexico City, which actually is an amazing city in a lot of ways. I know Mexico gets a lot of bad press because of the northern drug trade and stuff, but Mexico City just kind of felt like Toronto, to be honest, for the most part. But... Um, um, but we were in like the shanty towns with the garbage dump, Nesa, for any Mexicans, it's Nesa Coyotol, I think is how you say it. And it's like the, uh, massive garbage. Dump. In fact, you know, that movie Elysium, there was like a, it was a movie with Matt Damon a few years ago. It was like oh, yeah, a, a yeah. dystopian. I never saw it, but, but it was actually shot in one of the oh, okay. Mexican garbage dumps. And for all the social justice warrior talk, that all those Hollywood stars do, I think they actually had to break down a shanty town in order to shoot the movie. So there you go. Oh, all right. Yeah, Excellent. of course. Excellent. Yeah. Shut <laughs> up. Yeah, that's that's a problem for the Hollywooders, but also the Mexican government that would allow that. But in any case, um, there was uh, I remember the second time I was there, there was a woman because we, we, we what we would do is we basically would set up like a medical clinic um, and do our best. to. We had some doctors that volunteer and we just kind of help and whatever. And but one woman, she came and she was just getting vitamins for her kids. We'd give out tons of vitamins because that ministry can go there every four months or so through renewal ministries. And, um, but she had nine kids, she had nine kids and she lived in a shanty town and, um, she was happy. I mean, I'm not saying I'm romanticizing it and let's all switch places. Okay. But it was remarkable, the faith and, and even a lot of the husbands, cause a lot of the families were intact. Um, and they still had sort of a traditional lifestyle somehow. They still tried to make that work where, mom or the moms would be with their kids most of the time until they were school age. And then the husbands would be doing whatever they had to do. And anyway, it was just, um, I remember coming back from there the first time and being absolutely obliterated, just like, oh, uh, you know, my fancy Western life. I mean, things like toilet paper, <laughs> you know, just all these things that you have and being really inspired by some of the men <clears throat> who worked really hard and were the spiritual heads of their families. And they lived in a shanty town. It was remarkable. Yeah, that's legit. We'll, we'll talk in a few minutes about a man's work, which is the title of the show, really. But um, yeah, shout out to Makotam and Cairo, which is where I went with the okay. garbage slum dwellers. The um, yeah, the that is the remarkable thing is when they make it work, and that's our charge in the Western society to make the traditional family work. Yeah. 
And one of the most difficult things about it is the economics of it, because yeah. especially for us, we have such a high standard of living. So it's also very expensive and yeah. we need to regulate that in order to have the expenses down enough so that the man can have enough money to provide for the family so that the children can have their rights, which is yeah. their mother. Yeah. And the mother can have her rights, which is to be a mother. Yeah, yeah so that's that's, that's, that's a man's duty for his work. So getting back, bringing it all together. The, so the Labor Day as a civic holiday. So initially, the, the initial period of suppressing the feast days and the holy days between Henry VIII, uh, the French Revolution created a 10 day week. Oh, yeah. uh, so they actually suppressed Sunday. Um, yeah. And the in the 19th century, you had seven seven day work weeks which was suppressing sunday altogether people were working 10 11 12 hours a day women and children forced into factories and whatnot and there's more to the story than that there's a lot of other aspects to it but the point is the labor movement of labor unions sought mm -hmm. to counter this and this was the era of the blue laws which was where in various places canada united states where these different organizations lobbied and protested in order to get Sunday off, mm -hmm. have laws on the books that protected the Lord's Day as a day of rest. And this is also when the later on in the 20th century, I believe the the weekend came into, into existence and the 40 hour work week, at least in the United States, you guys have a 40 hour work week in- uh, Yeah, January nine week? to five, I mean, whatever. Nine to five thing? Yeah. Maybe eight to five if your breaks an hour or whatever. Yeah. Right. So the so the Labor Day as a civic holiday began was instituted to sort of celebrate the labor unions achievements mm -hmm. in sort of beating back the extreme exploitation of the yeah. uh, eleven hour work days, seven days a week, whatnot. But you notice that the original holidays were in existence, but they were suppressed. And then yeah. finally, now we have, so now we have these secular holidays and there, there is a lot less of them too than compared to the religious holidays in the past. So, um, so you know, we have these holidays, we kind of bought them back or people did, I mean, uh, but there's, we have an issues with uh, some of this, uh, some of the labor unions, obviously um, with communism. Uh, but now we have these secular holidays, which aren't really dedicated to Jesus Christ or his saints. Um, but we've got a holiday. So, so when would those blue laws have come into place? Just, I'm, I'm thinking of Our Lady of La Salette here because yeah, and that's, that's a very, very, very good point because yeah. So Our Lady of La Salette and St. John Vianney, both yeah. in the early 19th century, Our Lady mm -hmm. of La Salette's 1846, that's right. which is the first year that the potato famine was hitting Ireland and Europe. Yeah. And Our Lady of La Salette says that for two sins, God is smiting the Europeans, the two sins are blasphemy yep. and working the keeping of the Lord's day working yep. on Sunday. And yep. so there, I'm, and yeah, go ahead. Well, that would make sense. Like, I mean, that makes sense when it's institutionalized. I mean, obviously we've always had in, it's in the gospel. I mean, if your ox goes into the ditch, you get him out if it's Sabbath, right? Obviously there's necessary things. Farmers and ER doctors can't just not say, sorry, you're going to die today. I can't work at Sunday. But, um, uh, but the institutionalized work of the way that you're talking about, that makes sense. And that, I just, I never thought of that with Lost Light. It just came to my mind that she came around right at that time. Anyway, so yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Irish Revolution, late 18th century. That's the first industrial revolution. Everybody's, right. and this is one of the biggest things about this modern world that we're talking about is that the, la the loss of an agrarian culture. Yeah. Everybody's urbanized, not everybody, yeah. but most people are living in cities. So then they're living in factories. The family is split apart. This is the beginning of feminism. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got to work on uh, all, all the time. Yeah. And so this is a very interesting point about the economic history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so now we're here in, in this labor day where we're celebrating something where labor unions have sort of bought back Sunday yeah. to a great degree. But still you have, I mean, Sunday just means, at least in America, I mean, Sunday just means that other people work. Yes. The real retail store or whatever the, uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Like the yeah, retail the, stores, the restaurants, stores and all that. Open. Yeah.
So I was just thinking a couple of directions we'd go with this. On the one, just real quickly, unions are a uh, conundrum because there have been legitimate instantiations of associations and things like that. I'm thinking of the solidarity movement in Poland, which was a reaction to, to obviously right. communist oppression. And we'll get into Lefebvre in a little while because we're going to talk about Vigano's letter a bit. But his dad was, um, uh, well, there was, the, there was the Action Française, which was not Catholic, but there was also like the Catholic action movement and things like that in France. And it was a way of counteracting the overly, overly secularized sort of communist union motif with a Catholic option because the the one thing that unions fight for obviously is the rights of the workers and so forth. But unfortunately it's done a lot of the time in a Marxist mentality where the labor class is against the employing class, which then just creates more of this class warfare. So the Catholic answer, which is always the right answer was um, all. In, so in, in, in uh, Lefebvre's father's, Man, he was in manufacturing, you know, things like uh, Northern France is big in manufacturing of textiles and things. And so everyone who worked in the organization was in the union together, which it was the point was you have your workers and you have your employers rather than make decisions separate from each other. You actually had to get together like once a month or something. And it was amazing. It was actually it was it was like, listen, we can't go back. We have this industrialized society. We're not just going to put the genie back in the bottle. We have factories. We have these sorts of things. So if we're going to live together, we have to do it actually together. And they did that. So that's kind of, I think, the third way that the church always offers us. Um, but just as far as work goes, um, work itself is not necessarily a punishment. We were made to work. Adam was made to work in the garden. But it's the servile work. It's living on bread alone kind of thing, which is the punishment. So if we think about the scriptures, Adam is made to till the garden. And I've heard, and maybe you know this from your Greek and stuff, I've I've heard from people that um, the word till can also mean to protect. I mean, it's not just go and, and, and it's not solely go and labor is the point. Um, but there is an aspect where we were made with a purpose, okay? And um, without that purpose, we don't really have our fulfillment. If we're not actually doing something useful with our time, if we're not producing something, there is very little purpose in our life, at least on a natural level. And that's one of the truths that, um, you know, this sort of capitalist materialist mindset, it really does play on a partial truth. We do get a lot of satisfaction out of working. We do get a lot of satisfaction out of producing things because that's in our nature. But where it goes wrong is where the end of that work is seen as like the end of life. You know, the end of that work is I'm a businessman and I've got whatever, therefore I must be happy, right? That your your work and your vocation and your occupation has to be a means to something that sanctifies your health, your, your family, your community, and so forth. So work is a good thing, and we ought to work better and smarter. Um, but work has become an idol, I think, in our North American and Western society because it's the means to getting material, which if we have enough of that, then we're basically happy. Which ironically, this is why Father Ripperger says. Um, obviously, we think of North America being all capitalist and things, and in a sense, we are. But he says, uh, we're just as Marxist in our ultimate mentality as so many places, because if you think about an election, which is going on right now in the States, and we might have a snap election here in the in the fall, because Justin Trudeau, our prime minister, like all liberal prime ministers the last 50 to 100 years, is a total corrupt weasel. And he's finding out there's major financial scandals, so we'll see if they dissolve the parliament. But in any case... Um, uh, it's always about jobs, right? I mean, who's going to, who's the best prime minister? Who's the best president? The one who's going to give us the jobs. Why is that the best? Because if we have the jobs, we have the stuff. And if we have the stuff, then we're happy. What could be better, right? Obviously, it's a different, uh, it's a different uh, approach than the Marxist idea of state control of everything. And here's your, here's your bread. But it is a similar kind of end of as long as we all have stuff, then we'll be equal. Anyway, that's my two cents on it. Oh, yeah, it's materialist. Yeah. It's just a pull between two different materialistic views of society. One is the American view, and one is the communist view. And they're both materialistic, so they both have the same ends, Yeah, which is material prosperity yep. without its final end of supernatural prosperity, yep. which really plays on a false or a, a half-truth which yep. is the important thing to realize because 
there, we cannot reject work. Like you're saying, that's great. Um, the Sunday rest is what rebukes the constant work, workaholic mentality. Yeah. The moral theologians say that the, what is what is forbidden on Sunday is the commercial work and servile work. So yeah. buying and selling goods, uh, unless you have a necessity, certainly buy your medicine Ooh, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, and then servile work, which is more manual labor, labor that is more tiring and whatnot. But then the what is permitted is the cultural work, the the yeah. work that elevates your mind and soul. Yeah. So creating a painting. Yeah. Writing a book, right? Reading a book, yeah. Uh, relaxing with one's family, yeah. Etc. Things yeah. that are elevating you. So it really, I think that framework of Sunday really allows one's weekly work. That's the servile work, whatever you got to do for your daily bread. Yeah. And then it elevates it to what is what is that? What is the purpose of that work? It is the lifting of your mind and heart to God. Yeah on Sunday. So I think that really, that understanding of Sunday really uh, focuses that. I really, we haven't, um, like we've, we've talked about, my oldest is in Catholic school, but my right. second oldest has begun homeschooling. And I'd really like to, because we're homeschooling, we then can create this Christian culture of mm -hmm. the week yeah. so that we can Obviously, we rest on Sunday, then we, but then we can take days off on these holy days so that every year, every week, they can have this cycle, this rhythm. They can grow up with that, mm -hmm. that they never had. I never had. Yeah, me either. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, it's it's interesting. And, um, you know, when you're talking about the cultural works, um, I was thinking that, you know, some of that will depend, too, on, like, basically, if you're lifting your mind and your heart to things that are actually recreative that actually make refresh you for the week that actually give you good uh, utrapelia good recreation right recreation with right leisure with your family i was just thinking for example in my situation um my kids are just coming of age where they can be really helpful i mean my oldest my oldest will be five in october my second year will still be four in October. So not really, they're not old, but, but they're coming of age where if I actually say, can you help me go rake the leaves or something like that, they can actually have some fun doing it. So for me on a Sunday, even though it seems like servile work to go and do work in the yard or whatever, but it would be me going out with my boys and just kind of working away slowly, but having a blast outside with my kids and they'd be jumping in leaf piles and helping me. And that would actually be something sort of a recreation for us. Right. Whereas if you are on Sunday and you're saying, oh, I could really use this day to, I don't know, finish renovating the garage or something like that. And you're just kind of kind of work and be away from your family. That wouldn't be a proper usage of the day because it would be isolating yourself for the ones you love. Does that make sense? So sometimes, yeah. the, sometimes the actual task itself can be arbitrary depending on your intent and how you're doing it. Yeah. Um, definitely family time. Um, the, yeah, I, essential for sunday uh, yeah. absolutely um so the more back into what you were saying about the meaning of work the i think of it as particularly for the in the man's case man is endowed by god with strength physical yeah. strength and god has ordained that physical strength to be put to use in the garden before the fall mm -hmm to cultivate the garden, to, uh, yeah, serve and protect it as the different phrase phrases or the translations go from that. Yep. Um, so there is a, a great natural good work that a man is ordained to yep. that his order, his, his physical strength is ordered towards the, now I think that that in particular is the violent outlet that a man needs to take his his violence that he has, which is is really his strength. Yep. He needs to take this violence and he needs to place it in the service of work, in the service of his family. Right. So that he has this focus, because if you don't have that violent outlet, if a man does not have this outlet in order to use his strength to exert his strength, 
I think that men will naturally, because they have a natural endowment of strength, they will naturally attempt to assert that violence elsewhere if they don't have the work, if they don't have that focus. So then they try to dominate other people, dominate women, abuse yeah. women, um, et cetera. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, video games, whatever. Well, that, and that's true. I mean, think about all the activities that, uh, yeah, think about all the activities that um, men, generally speaking, gravitate to. Obviously, on the more athletic side, uh, the gym, which is good. I mean, working out, obviously, is healthy for you. Maybe the setting might not be proper depending on the gym, but but exercise is good. Things like axe throwing, are is that a hobby down where you are? Do you guys have like axe throwing places opening up? No, no we don't. It's have a axe it's throwing. a thing around here. Maybe it's just our Canadian lumberjack roots, I guess. Um, but uh, there, there's one here in town. I think it was closed for most of Corona, and now it's probably open again. But but uh, you know, you just go in and you learn how to throw hatchets, and it's like a place. I think you can have drinks and throw hatchets. So I don't know how that works. But <laughs> <laughs> but but that's a thing that people are getting into now. They're throwing axes. Well, why? Because it's satisfying to chuck a sharp thing at a tree. Um, video games. I've never been into video games. I wasn't very good at them. And my PlayStation 2 got stolen when I was in grade 10. So that was kind of the end of my video game career. And then from then on, I've played like NHL and Madden like a half a dozen times with friends. So now when I try it, when I show up, if it's like a buddy's bachelor party and we're playing like NHL or something and you have to aim the shot with one of the joysticks, I'm like, I'm out. I used to do <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to hold speed burst and then hold the slap shot <laughs> button. And like, that's about it. But, um, but the video games, I mean, and it, we could use the word competitive as well instead of just violence because, because there is a, there is a, you know, I don't believe obviously I really don't believe in Darwinian evolution, as everyone knows, who knows me a bit. But there is a half-truth in there, or a partial truth of there is a competitiveness against nature. There is, you know, my friend and I, we were kind of joking. I'm like, you know, we don't believe in evolution, but I'm starting to look at a sort of post, like with all the COVID stuff and the way that people are just doing the most ridiculous things that you've ever seen in your life. And we were kind of like, I'm starting to believe in a sort of post-fall survival of the fittest, <laughs> you know, like what people are subjecting themselves to that makes no sense and whatever. But um, but there is a competitiveness we have of nature. You've got to compete with the elements. Adam is told to leave the garden and he's got to go basically kind of work now instead of instead of being in conjunction with nature, he's got to go work against nature in order to survive. He's got to work amongst the thorns and the thistles, the sweat of his brow, and he's still going to die anyway. There's this sort of fatalism to it. So there's uh, there's an aspect there. So the violence needs to be, and the aggression, the competitiveness, and you see this in, in men who are in the workplace, and they have no, oh man, they have no uh, authority over anything really, you know? And that's kind of the key is having sovereignty and authority over something where you feel like you have a purpose and it's really important for men to have that and so many don't have that you know and so what do you do you either get into a habit of you know because in the book that we're putting out soon in one of the chapters i talk about evil images you know pornography and um it's actually the the, the way that i describe it it's actually a violent uh, activity because it's an abusive it's an abuse towards oneself so I, I think that there's probably a um, a, cor a correlation there between the rise in these habits like video game usage and evil image usage, usages because they really are violent habits where somebody dominates another. You know, they're in control. And a lot of that would probably have to stem from this servile indentured servitude to the you know, to the wage slave sort of mentality. And that's an unholy way of having an outlet to that. So that makes sense what you're saying. Yeah, like what you said, the uh, 30, 40 days a year, the feudal peasant had to work for his master. And the master also had duties to him. He had to pay his labor to the, yeah. to the master, to the Lord. And the Lord had a duty to then send out his knights to protect him against the Vikings who were invading. Or if the peasant died, he had life insurance from the Lord. Lord took care of his, his widow. And they had fun. Like they actually, so <laughs> like um, everyone should read Hilaire Belloc's um, Christmas. I can't remember what it's called, but he reflects on what his Christmas was like growing up. And it was a remnant of that sort of Christendom feudalism. His family, I believe, were sort of wealthy, 
But because they were the sort of wealthy kind of lords of the town they were in, um, every Christmas, it was like the right of the townspeople was to have, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> was to have a major Christmas celebration at the house of the Lord. So their house was open. There was dancing, fiddle music. I mean, all the wonderful, you know, he was, uh, they were like uh, French and English. So they had, yeah, that sort of, and there's a lot of Celtic stuff in Northwestern France where I think it's oh, yeah. So they had, they would have had some great music and the, proper recreation and they so they had christmas eve was described you know they'd go to the vigil or whatever and then then after that they'd have some sort of meatless something or other because of the christmas eve and then they would have they'd come home and they just party all night and it was all and everyone got a present they had to buy gifts for everybody and they and the lords would take pleasure in it they'd say oh you know so and so has a daughter who's this age she's gonna love this thing or that thing like it was beautiful it was wonderful i'm not saying it was all perfect you know we can always look with rose-colored glasses <clears throat> but there was a duty that the lord had to his uh you know not peasants but whatever the word would be as much as the um underclass had to the lord and it created a harmony between the two classes where you know i mean social mobility wasn't the same i guess uh, but nonetheless, there wasn't this feeling, it wasn't like a state of oppression. It was kind of the opposite. It was more of kind of recognizing the natural inequalities that we just kind of always will have. And we're still seeing that today and we'll never get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, interdependent <laughs> rights and duties on, exactly. uh, on everybody's side. Everybody's got rights and duties to one another. It's a communitarian uh, model. It's not an equal uh, sort of wealth inequality <laughs> is accepted because people need the noble Lord needs more wealth so he can buy his gifts for his peasants, his Christmas party. You know, he's got to have that extra money for that purpose. Yeah. Uh, but l let's get on to, to Vigano. Okay. Uh, I wanted to touch on this because Vigano put two letters out yes, last week. Yep. One in which he said, quote, I consider Archbishop Lefebvre an exemplary confessor of the faith, and I think that by now it is obvious that his denunciation of the council and modernist apostasy is more relevant than ever. Mm -hmm. He says that the, um, the hidden and silent work has been carried out by the Society of St. Pius X, which deserves recognition for not having allowed the flame of tradition to be extinguished at a moment in which celebrating the ancient mass was considered subversive, and a reason for excommunication. So then he caught he he draws the causality of mm -hmm. sumorum pontificum ultimately, mm -hmm. which is the liberalization of the Geology. true the good liberalization of the Latin Mass, meaning everybody can celebrate the Latin Mass. You don't need permission from a bishop. Was he draws the the cause of that from Lefebvre and the society? Yep. And so Vigano says it should be obvious by now. He's a confessor of the faith, which. Which is quite a twist, I think, at this point, because we've had a lot of controversy with the society mm -hmm. between yeah. um, mm -hmm. various forces which believe the society to be schismatic, even in the trad world. Yeah, and everybody has followed after Vigano as sort of their leader in in many ways. But then mm -hmm. Vigano has come out on the side of Lefebvre and the society. Well, let's think of the two. Who are the two leaders right now in the trad world? You have uh, Schneider. And you have Vigano. I mean, Burke kind of, but Burke's been kind of silent um, for a little while. And these two leaders in the traditionalist movement, and not just for not just for traditionalists, but for all Catholics who recognize that there is a need for a revival of true orthodoxy. Um, it's Schneider and it's Vigano. I mean, that's about it right now, as far as actual clerics go. And both of them have praised Lefebvre. I mean, um, Schneider visited an SSPX seminary in 2015 and came out and said what everyone always says, even at the time, I don't want to get too much on my SSPX soapbox, soapbox here, but even at the time of, uh, in the 1980s, when there was the major controversy, uh, Cardinal Gagnon, who was kind of a conservative middle of the road, he was sent to be with uh, the SSPX for about a month going through their seminaries and things. And he was astonished. I mean, they have a whatever, I can't remember what it was, one of the, you know, like you have a booklet, you write, the, if you're a guest, you write, you know, your thoughts on, basically if you go to bed and breakfast and you write. Yeah, guest have, book. Yeah, guest book. They have things like that at um, <clears throat> seminaries. And they have a note from Gagnon talking about, you know, the, the treasure that you have in Archbishop Lefebvre. And he just was beaming of how, how Catholic it was and how pious it was and how just 
wonderful it was when he left the SSPX seminary. Yeah, and just, just, just for viewers, Gagnon was also the guy who investigated. He took three years and interviewed everybody at the Curia in 1978. Yeah. And he investigated the whole ring of corruption that was in the, in the Vatican in 1978. Yeah. And he knew, so he understood corruption. And yeah. because there, there are allegations, which we'll, we'll address as well with the society that yeah. are still outstanding. Yeah. But Gagnon at the time, I, I can't remember when the, his visitation was in the 80s, 85, 86. It was 88. 88. Okay. So, yeah. so 10 years later, Gagnon has already, he's been, he's been around the block in terms of corruption. Yeah. He's really the most, one of the most knowledgeable person is about the Vatican corruption. And he goes to the society and he says, it's this model seminary and he praises it at the time. Yeah. And that's like Vigano. Vigano is the, Vigano is all, knows all the corruption. I mean, with heavy hearts, we just probably read the thing about Benedict and the cover up and things. And I really do appreciate LifeSite News because when they do things like this, they're always extremely well researched and they are fair. And it's not salacious. It's not tabloid uh, the way that some other outlets might be. Uh, and the report they did on Benedict, I thought was heartbreaking, but was also fair. So shout out to LifeSite for the balanced journalism that they do offer. You can tell when LifeSite does something that they actually do love the church. They really love the church and they really love the faith. And they they look at our clerics like fathers, which we should. So they do everything they possibly can to give them the benefit of the doubt, which you should do for your fathers. And it's just facts and it's just true. So good for them. But but in any case, Vigano knows where all the skeletons are buried. You know, I mean, this he knows everything uh, about what's going on as, as much as anybody does. And he is coming out praising the Society of St. Bias X and Archbishop Lefebvre. And now we also recently have um, Micah Hickson, because she has, always has a German correspondence, an unnamed cardinal, which I'm hoping will come out soon, um, from Germany is saying that he thinks Lefebvre will be a doctor of the church. And, um, you know, just <clears throat> for a quick second here, for people who are very skeptical, you see, the, the problem is, recently I saw this video, some kid in my area as a seminarian put out a video um, trying to explain the SSPX to everybody in a whole 18 minute video. And I was like, Oh, wow. Wonderful. You cracked the, you finally figured it out in 18 minutes, didn't you? And, um, gave about a minute, honestly, like one, one minute to two minutes on who Mar Marcel Lefebvre was. And it's always, I've actually have grown in a great devotion to Marcel Lefebvre as a saint. We actually have a picture of him on my wall and a lot of traditionalists do that. Even, even ones that aren't in the SSPX or I'm not in it, but you know what I mean? That attend. And if you read his biography and you really investigate his life, the consecrations was one event out of a life of almost 88 years. That is like reading the life of a saint. It really was. And whether people think that he should have done the consecrations or not, <clears throat> he was a missionary. He was, I mean, if you think Africa is a good Catholic continent at this point, which it is one of the strongest places on earth, Lefebvre had a lot to do with that. I mean, in Dakar, which is Senegal, there was like uh, millions of baptisms that happened under him and they kept increasing. And obviously that was not just his work, but he was able to manage all of these different orders and missionary orders, Jesuits and Dominicans and Holy Ghost Fathers and everybody in Africa and somehow build this cohesive rise in Catholicism and French speaking Africa, which is most of Catholic Africa is French speaking. Um, even when he went back to France, and the, in the interim, war, uh, after a Second World War, he was put in charge of a seminary and was basically charged with rebuilding a seminary after the Second World War in France and was somehow successful at it. Everything this guy touched that had to do with the faith, it flourished. He had like the Midas touch as far as, you know, they, they made him, he was a bushman. He was he was fixing cars and building bridges in, in, in little fishing villages in Western Africa. He was running uh, seminaries in Africa. He was running major dioceses on a whole continent. He was... Um, he was having meals with Charles de Gaulle and trying to discuss international politics between, you know, the, the free French and the whatever, you know, he did everything. And when he finally decided to start the Society of St. Pius X, it was in response. It was in response to children. That's how I look at it. You know, uh, his spiritual children who were the French speaking Catholics, they came to him and they said, they were in seminary or wanted to go into seminary and they went back after these major changes after the council and it was unrecognizable. You know, we, we sometimes forget, you know, for, for my, my appeal here is sort of my traditionalist or conservative Catholic friends who, um, 
they don't appreciate the contrast that was the post-Second Vatican Council. You know, you leave one day, and this actually happened to a lot of people. You leave your parish for six months because it's under renovations. And the day that you leave, it's traditional mass, all these sorts of things. And it's statuary, and it's a high altar, and it's icons, and the whole nine yards. It looks like a beautiful, it looks Catholic, let's put it that way. And you come back six months later, and you've got a table altar, and you've got seating in the round, and you've got white walls, and you've got these grotesque felt banners, and you've got folk music. I mean, that was literally what happened to some people. Um, people were leaving the church by the millions at this time in this time in, in history. And Lefebvre was a father who watched his children suffer. And they came to him and they said, we need your help. What do you do? Do you just say, no, I'm sorry, you'll be fine? You can't do that. You have to respond to your children. Okay. And he did that. And the initial suppression of the society was because of the Latin mass. They would not say it. Uh, that wasn't the initial position. In fact, for the first five years or so of that, um, the endeavor he had with the spiritual year of formation that they turned into a seminary, they actually did say the Sacrosanctum Concilium recommended liturgy. So they did things like they took out the Judica May at the beginning. They did the readings just from the pulpit. The 1965 they, Missal. Yeah, they did yeah. that. It wasn't like a, it w he wasn't a liturgist per se. He was just, he just realized what was oh, fine and organic, sort of uh, an authentic, as Peter Kwasniewski said so well in your, in your interview, it was an authentic change. Okay, this is organic. We can see this happening versus a complete restruct re restruct restructuring or destruction of the liturgy. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't put up with the destruction. Anyway, going too much in my soapbox. So now what, now what would you say, Kennedy, because has there not been just as there has been with John Paul II or Benedict now, uh, hasn't there been an exposure of deep corruption in the society of St. Pius X that goes back to the beginning? I wouldn't say deep corruption. Like, I need to be careful when I with this because <clears throat> uh, clearly there have been uh, some society of St. Pius X priests, and I've never met one. I mean, I just I don't know any of these guys, but clearly there have been some who have been caught being derelicts, just like you've seen in every priestly society in the world and every diocese, okay? As far as corruption goes, Stephen Cox is doing a expose. He's going to go, he's going to look at the church militant allegations and things. This is my opinion, and I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not taking this to the bank that I'm going to die on this hill, but I'm just saying this is my opinion on the matter. I think the major claim that is being made is that Bishop Fillet who was one of the bishops of the society and was a superior for about 12 years. One of the, one of the claims being made is that he himself, well, while he was in charge, was knew of a derelict priest and transferred him in a way and put him in ministry with kids. That's what is being claimed. I have read, because a lot of people don't understand, most of the SSPX is not in the English-speaking world. It's actually huge in France and Germany and in Africa and places like that. Most people in the world don't actually know what Church Milton is, which might come to the surprise of people at Church Milton. But um, so a lot of this, I was talking to some uh, one of my priests, because here in Canada, uh, there's a lot of French-speaking SSPXers, obviously, because of Quebec. It's big in Quebec. And most of them had no idea what Church Milton was saying, because they don't watch English-speaking things. <laughs> and one of the priests that was in um, the report heard about what was going on in this church militant thing like a month after it came out because it's just not on their radar okay and he's in uh f he's one of the french i can't remember his name but he's one of the french speakers that was in belgian or something and he was in charge of one of these things that are being alleged and he was horrified because of the misrepresentation of what had actually happened so we will wait for stephen cox to come out um with the full report because that's necessary and i i'm really happy that a person from LifeSite is doing it because they'll be fair um, but as far as deep corruption, I don't think there is deep corruption in the SSPX. I hope that I'm correct. And if I'm wrong, I will eat crow and I will not accept that in any whatever. Um, but I don't think there is deep corruption in the SSPX. I think what we have ultimately is, I'm going to use an analogy here. So basically, if I, I'm a teacher, I'm taking a year off this year, but I'm a teacher, okay? There are teachers who are sexual predators. It's something that happens, okay? We can, you can read about them in your you know, local school board newspaper, whatever. 
The problem is, is that there's, a, there's all of the people involved in all of these organizations, they deserve due process. So even when a teacher is accused of something, they have to go through a due process for it. It's possible that a teacher could be, go through an investigation and come out innocent, but actually be guilty and no one knows. And then later on in life, they end up actually abusing somebody else again, which unfortunately happens. What seems to have happened with the SSPX is there was the one priest, I can't remember his name. Um, he was accused of something in Switzerland. Um, and he went through a threefold investigation. The cops, the canonical procedures, and he was interviewed by a psychologist. What happened was, is they came out and the authorities found that he was innocent. Now, the family that accused him believed that he wasn't, and it turned out later that they were correct. The problem is, what do you do in a situation like that? It isn't an easy question. To use the teacher analogy, I mean, if you are a teacher and you're accused of something, and you're actually guilty, for example, but the cops, the professional association, whatever, there's no evidence for it, they can't, whatever, what do you do? Do you get rid of the teacher? I mean, you've gone through the investigation and it's turned out that he's not guilty in the eyes of the law. I don't know. What you do in a situation like that, what always happens is you try to find a place to put that person. So me, for example, I'm a coach. I'm obviously, I've not been accused of anything, but if you're a coach, let's say, and you're accused of something and you've never done that thing, it doesn't matter if you're innocent or guilty. You'll never probably coach again. They'll probably just put you off somewhere else or you'll have to leave and go to a different state or whatever. With this SSPX priest, what happened was is they moved him to Belgium. Okay. And he was put on a 10 year ban in Switzerland of being around in, in ministry with minors. So people look at that and they go, Oh, look, that must mean they know that he was guilty. No, that's not how it works. If you are a coach, let's use an analogy again, and you're accused of something, but you're not guilty. The reality is, is that for public perception and for the trust of the players and the, and the, the league, they will probably not let you coach again for a long time because they just can't. Once again, what do you do? Well, we know we, we were told he's innocent, but you all believe that he's a predator. No one's going to allow you around their kids, rightfully so, because they don't know. And that's one of the, that's one of the terrible realities of um, true and false accusations in this arena of sexual uh, abuse. So they moved this priest to Belgium and he stayed at a residence that in the summer is used for a boys camp. Anyway, the, the, there's more into it than that, but essentially he stayed at this place. And then when it was actually used for the boys camp in the summer, they moved him to another place um, off site or down, you know, away from where like, the boys were. Um, and then at the summer camp where the abuse actually took place, they left out in the church militant report that the fathers were actually staying with their boys on the same floor in a ratio of like one father to four or five boys. Um, so it was not as if, you know, they left a lot out in the church Milton report. Let's put it that way. So I think looking at this, that uh, the SSPX could have been harsher on this priest. And I don't know, maybe you, I don't know Do you put it. The problem is, do you put him in an apartment in the city and then he's alone? You know, like it's, it really is a hard thing. What you do with these priests because if they're not found guilty as the law and you don't have a legal recourse against them, but you can't just, but, but you're saying maybe they are guilty. You can't just send them out into public because then what happens if, if you send a priest out into the public to live in an apartment, let's say, then he has free range to be. So it's, it isn't, it is an impossible situation. And one thing that we have to start doing is we need to stop blaming the and I'm not just not just the SSPX. We need to stop trying to find fault with every single administrative action with these orders of priests, and we have to start blaming the predator. That's one thing that's being lost in all this. People are people are saying this guy was a, a derelict, and the SSPX should have done better. Fair enough. How about we start blaming Satan? How about we start blaming Judas? How about we start blaming? I mean, you know, uh, what about the twelve apostles? Should they have done better? Judas was in there, right? Well, let's blame Judas because Judas was the traitor. You know, people of goodwill, apostles of goodwill, priests of goodwill, they're not going to assume that somebody is a sexual predator because that's not somebody something you assume about anybody. So you do your best with what you have. And unfortunately, and I can tell you this, growing up, going to camps for football camps and things, they were always very safe, right? I mean, we had our coaches sleeping in the coach cabin and, and we had the players' cabins and we had the captains with them. All the measures were taking place. 
But if you are a abuser, you will find a way. It might be a guy, a kid going off to the washroom in the middle of the night. I mean, don't imagine this, but if you are an abuser, you will find a way. The real thing that needs to be done here, if we want any reform in the church about how to deal with sexual predators, is they have to bring back the codes. They have to bring back the, the penalties of the old canon law. And any sexual malfeasance basically results in la laicization. That's what needs to happen. The real problem here is that Society of St. Pius X has a priest, and this is, we're just talking about the European situation, who was not found guilty. They couldn't do anything to him. They moved him to a new country because, once again, you can't stay where you are because no one's going to want to be around you. That's normal. They gave him a job where he basically wasn't doing anything, and he still found a way. I don't know how they could I mean, I don't know how they could have done it much different, to be honest. So that's my thoughts. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it could be similar to John Paul II, who is a great hero against communism, but it may be admitted, like we were talking about Gagnon, Gagnon gave his dossier to John Paul II about the corruption of the Vatican in 1978 when John Paul II was elected, but John Paul II failed to act against this corruption. James Grind says that he told John Paul II about McCarrick in 1987. Mm -hmm. And so the the corruption whatever corruption is existent in the society may also exist as well as it exists elsewhere in the church yeah and so we need uh, certainly need due process and uh the difficulties that we're facing and difficulty that these things are in uh, create very difficult uh but i think the simplest simplest solution definitely i, I agree with you the simple solution is sexual malfeasance, automatic lay cessation. Yeah, and I will say one more thing too. In the Church Militant Report, um, they actually take the pedophile's word for it over Lefe or Filet. Um, so the Filet claims that he didn't know about these. Basically, when this priest was moved around, Cole's notes, Filet, Filet claims he didn't know about what was going on until after uh, and didn't move him knowing that there was these, whatever, we didn't allow the move knowing there were these, these censures in place. Whereas the where Church Militant points to a letter from the pedophile, how would they have if this was a letter sent to Fillet? Do you think that Church Militant has access to Fillet's documents? You think they're friends? I don't think so. So this is a letter that was sent by the pedophile, apparently validating things that Church Militant had said. Why are we trusting a pedophile over somebody who is known to be an upstanding, virtuous man? Why do you trust anything from a pedophile? I mean, th this guy went through a process in Switzerland and was found and lied his way through the whole thing. I mean, he's a sociopath. He literally lied to a say He somehow fooled a psychologist. He fooled the, the police and he fooled the, fooled the canonical processes. And he was actually guilty. Why are we trusting this guy? It could be right. He could have sent it. But we have no evidence that this was ever received by Filet. We have no evidence from Filet that he ever read it. And we have no evidence that it was even ever sent to Filet in the first place. I mean, how do they have a copy of the letter if the letter sent? I'm just saying there's, they're, they're trusting the pedophile in the... They use his testimony against Filet rather than using Filet's testimony, which they don't have because they don't talk to him, against the, the pedophile. So, yeah. Yeah. I, at least we'll have a... Uh, it seems like there well, there will be more thorough investigation than yes. we can have of the Vatican uh, because we can't really get a lot out of the Vatican in terms of the Vatican corruption. That's right. But in terms of whatever corruption was pr pr past our present in the society can be investigated and rooted out. Um, and so it, it remains to be seen whether Vigano will take these allegations from Church Militant as... Uh, a factor in any further comments. He, he did make two comments last week mm -hmm. about Lefebvre, both praising him, two yeah. different letters. <clears throat> so we will see if he continues on that line. Well, and also, and yeah. Vigano, but Vigano's comments, though, are just factually true. None of this has to do with Lefebvre, for one. Not, like, I mean, there is not a man alive who has had a stronger devil's advocate against him than Lefebvre. When the day comes that I think he'll be canonized, I don't. I mean, he might be the first saint in a long time. We'll have a devil's advocate, even if they don't actually do it, because it'll be his whole life. I mean, every if 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 the powers that be could find a way to do what they want to Archbishop Lefebvre and, and put him 
put them in the dustbin of history. Believe me, the last 30 years of trying to do that would be enough. Um, all they can come up with is some cockamamie theory that he was somehow a Nazi sympathizer when his dad died in a concentration camp trying to fight the Nazis. So you guys, that's ridiculous. But um, <clears throat> uh, but the, the, whether, whether Bishop Filet himself, uh, once again, I think if, if he get if he's guilty of anything, I think it's going to be malfeasance. I don't think it's deep whatever cover up. I think it's malfeasance. Anyway, if he is guilty of something that has nothing to do with Archbishop Lefebvre, and it doesn't have to do with the society as a whole. Um, and what v so Vigano said, Lefebvre was the man, and the society has done good work in keeping tradition. Both of those are factually true. So there's no reason why he would ever have to change those. Also, I think it is quite dubious this idea that. Vigano didn't know what church militant was saying. Somehow, every single uh, traditionalist English speaking, and Vigano is an English speaker as well, somehow all English speaking traditionalist Catholics on earth knew about the allegations about the SSPX. But somehow, Archbishop Vigano just had no idea. He just missed the last five months of Twitter and podcasts and, you know, Life Site and 1 Peter 5 and all these places that we know he reads all the time. So I think that's a little bit silly. Um, so he didn't say the SSPX was perfect. He said the SSPX has held the flame of tradition, which is just historically accurate. He didn't say, Lef and he said Lefebvre was great, which is also historically accurate. Um, and one thing that Vigano did say in his second letter, which we should touch on quick, he basically said, why don't you stop assuming schisms and work on your own, you know, rotten diocese that's full of heresy, okay? I think that's the, 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 the uh, I find it very strange how much effort people are putting in to trying to take down the Society of St. Pius X. I don't think it's, I think it's a diabolical disposition. And the reason for that is what grounds do any of us have to stand on if we're going to try and find and find if there is actual abuse and things, those things need to be dealt with. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we all belong to dioceses. We all go to Catholic colleges, whatever. The whole church is full of this rot, especially in North America. My diocese here, I mean, it's basically going bankrupt in some capacity because of the settlements they had to pay for everything that happened over the last 40 years. And that's a, that's a story everywhere. So let's all work at getting the log out of our own eyes before we worry about the speck in another's. If the SSBX has problems, then you deal with those problems. But instead of focusing all your energy which some people are doing for some reason. Instead of focusing all your energy on some malfeasance and derelict priests in a, in a priestly society, why don't you concern yourself with the true problem that facilitates all of these problems, which is heresy, apostasy, bad liturgy, bad catechesis, and so on and so forth, and clean up your own room before you worry about somebody else's. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and the counterpoint to that is, is that the idea that society is undermining the whole thing because it's undermining the legitimacy of the hierarchy and the magisterium and the new mass and et cetera, et cetera. But we can't really get into all the objections right now, unfortunately, but yeah. um, we, we may address those in the future. Um, we'd like to continue to have the debate about the SSPX because it's an important debate to have and we want all sides to be heard here at Meaning of Catholic there are certain things that are in undisputed regarding Lefebvre or the SSPX, and there are things that are disputed, which we want to dispute and we want to argue over as Catholics in uh, an environment of truth and charity instead of an environment of uh, you know Twitter back and forth and all this nonsense, which yeah. is just not unbecoming of Catholic men. Uh, yeah. So Catholic men, we're going to get together, we're going to debate it, we're going to do it face to face as much as we can here, and we'll hash it out. So that's that's the, the framework. And um, stay tuned because Kennedy is also releasing a book very soon Yeah. Um, in the next few weeks here. So we'll be talking about that as well in the future. But for now, let's offer up on our father. Let's pray for men to do the work that's necessary for their families, for societies, for the restoration of Catholic culture. Let's pray. Nomine Patris et Filii Spiritus Sancti. Amen. 
Vata nosa equius in chedi sancti vegeta noma tuum, adveniat redem tuum, fia voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobisodie, et dimitti nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimittimus debitoribus nostris, ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos amalo. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen.